Believe me, she's the type of girl you gotta knock two or three times on her back door and then you put it in. Oh my god. Hey, don't give me that. I know you've done it plenty of times. No, I mean... Aw, oh, jeez. Again? Again. Oh, oh, we got another one here, too. Son of a bitch. The I fuck? I don't understand this. Why is it always our place that these idiots come to die? I don't know. Wait a minute. You? It's Friday the 13th! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the bloodiest thing that ever happened in front of a camera. to another episode of Slaughter Film. It's been a while, but we're back, coming to you from our new location, uh, here, uh... Bum, shelter, fruit cellar... Wherever we are. But, um, fuck, you know what? We missed Friday the 13th. And that's bullshit, because, uh, you know, last year we mentioned how it was going to be a long, long wait to, uh, May 13th, 2011, the next time Friday the 13th would happen, and then it gets here... And what do we get for you guys? Nothing, because we're Little assholes. Big sack of crap. Well, we're making it up for you now. We have a very special Slaughter film for you. We're not just doing a double feature. We're not just doing a special feature this time. We're doing a fucking triple feature. Yeah, that's right. We're reviewing Friday the 13th Part 2, Friday the 13th Part 3, and then because we love you so much, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. We got a lot to go through, so uh, we got like, to blow right by it. Um, um, what's up? Before we get started, yes? I just had a quick question. Uh... What was part two about? Oh, that was the one where uh, Jason goes into the camp and starts slaughtering the counselors, you know. Okay. Well, well, if that was part two, well, what was part three? Uh, part three was the one where he, uh, you know, finds the kids that are vacationing and goes around killing them. Oh, okay. Well, then what's part four? Oh, well, part four is the one where he's killing teenagers. Yeah, there's not a lot in regards to story, so this sh this should be really a, a blow by. All right, let's get right down to it. Friday the thirteenth, part two. We begin just a few months after the events of the first movie. Our heroine, Alice, is still haunted by the murders, so she comes back to town to confront her fears. Will this help her regain her sanity and put an end to her crippling anxiety? Well, no. Instead, she's rewarded for her troubles with a severed head in the refrigerator and an ice pick through her temple. Fortunately, though, whoever the killer is is nice enough to take the tea kettle off her stove. Okay, so we're five minutes into the movie and the main character's dead. All right, uh, moving on. We then cut to five years later. A new camp has been opened near the infamous Camp Blood, and a whole new group of counselors has arrived to party, have premarital sex, and consume lots of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. You know, the usual stuff the kids do. Oh, yeah, and also find some time to actually do their job. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Sometimes. Still. Mostly sex and drugs. <laughs> However, the old legends start to resurface, and the kids find themselves confronted by our old friend, Crazy Ralph. Uh-oh. Who dies. Oh. oh. 
And all their partying and drunken shenanigans get them in trouble with a local cop who gets killed. Oh. I can't believe they killed Crazy Ralph. What the hell? He was the Prophet of Doom. You can't kill the Prophet of Doom in the beginning of your series. Well, I guess they didn't anticipate the, uh, what, seven sequels that we were going to have series, after this. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, most of the counselors head off to the bar, leaving a few couples behind to, well, you know, do drugs, pair off, have sex, probably anal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the usual. The usual. <laughs> Suffice to say, none of them lived through the night. In the end, our heroine, Ginny, played by Amy Steele, has confronted our killer. And now full-grown Jason Voorhees, who apparently, after drowning, has spent the last 20 years living in the woods. Hmm. Didn't know that uh, drowning, you know, does that to a person. Well, we're not medical experts, so we don't know. That's it could true. happen. Yeah, yeah. We're not. We're not scientists. Yeah. Jenny, a child psychology major, uses her incredible psychology powers to trick Jason into believing she's his mother. Now subdued, Jenny grabs a machete and puts an end to Jason's reign of terror. Finally, Jason is dead. Or is he? <gasps> no! Because he smashes through the window, scaring the shit out of Jenny and us, and taking us nicely into the next movie. Friday the 13th, part three, in 3D. Jason, you can't fight him. Stop him. And now, you can't even keep him on the screen. Friday, the 13th, part three, in 3D. Like all part three movies that were made around this time, Friday the 13th, part three, was filmed in 3D. Which means whenever the filmmakers got a chance to shove a bunch of shit at the camera, rest assured they're gonna do it. I am so glad that that whole 3D fad is just so done with. Stupid, it though. was really stupid. At least we're completely over that now. We're totally done with that it's, 3D it shit. It was really dumb. Oh. Wait. <laughs> Fucking nothing changes. <laughs> How is this shit any different from that stupid 80s stuff that you used to make fun of all the time? It's Sorry, so guys, gimmicky. It's like, incredibly gimmicky. <laughs> The formula got so bland that they need to spice it up with <laughs> blue and red glasses. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Transformers 3 in 3D is no different than Jaws 3 or Amityville 3D <laughs> or any other Part 3 movie that was filmed in 3D. 3D can suck on my three-dimensional balls. We begin with Jason taking care of some bickering married couple who I think are supposed to be comical but are really just annoying. We then follow some other kids who are heading into a cabin to party. But first, they encounter a brand new prophet of doom. Uh, this guy. Thank you. What are you doing, Jack? Thank you. Thank you. You are indeed, all of you, kind and generous young people. Look upon what his grace has brought unto me. What is that? I found this today. There were other parts of the body. That's an eyeball! But he said to me, he wanted me to have this. Yes. He wanted me to warn you. Look upon this omen and go back from whence ye came. I have warned I don't know, he's some drunk asshole who like has an eye for some reason which he shoves into her face. He's no Ralph. That's all no. we need to say is like... Dude, you killed off the most interesting guy way, way, way too early. And then you got this guy. Fortunately, this guy is not back for any other ones. I think they just sort of, like, get rid of the whole Prophet of Doom thing. It, well, I don't know. I guess there's only so many variations of your whole doom you can yeah. keep saying before it gets yeah. stale. Single eyes <laughs> and sleeping in the middle of the road for no reason at all isn't very fashionable. <laughs> Anyway, after playing pranks, shoving the yo-yo in front of our faces, and getting into a scrape with some scary 80s biker types, you start to forget you're watching a Friday the 13th movie. Hey, what the hell? I, uh... 
By this point in other Friday the 13th movies, at least five people have died. Did Jason take a vacation or something? <laughs> well, don't worry. Once Jason gets there, the pace really picks up. After dispatching the bikers, Jason then moves on to our teens, killing them off one by one, culminating in one of the most brutal killings in the whole series, the upside-down crotch split. Oh! Uh, oh. <laughs> that is a very good one. Uh, some of these movies got kind of lazy with the killings, but That's that true. one is classic. Yeah. That is it, great. It sort of seems like... Um, <laughs> I don't know, like, this kid tried out to be Shelly with, like, pranks and, he like... He was kind of jokey, Because he could juggle, he? too, yeah. with Shelly, you know what I mean? So he had all these little uh, tricks that he had, like, walking on his hands. Yeah. And, but he got he was a better actor or something, so... He, well, he, he wasn't really fat and awkward. Like, they saw that other That's guy. That's true, yeah. And he was, like, juggling, and then they, they, the real Shelly walked in, they are like... All, all other competition was just <laughs> gone by that He even point. has a girl's name. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, they, maybe uh, the audition for playing Shelly was just a big juggling contest. Maybe. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Juggle apples. Now eat one. Now eat that other one. Now eat the last one. Oh, one's got a razor in it. No, this isn't Halloween 2. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> also, one of Jason's victims is a prankster named Shelly, who's brought a whole bag of tricks to scare the crap out of his friends, including a hockey mask. Once Jason lays his eyes on that mask, it's love at first sight. After taking care of that annoying asshole Shelly, he forever forgoes his goofy burlap sack and horror movie history is made. Yeah. I actually like the burlap sack a little bit more. I mean, the burlap sack is more creepy. It is sort of creepy. But I think that's more in the realm of, like, the manic hillbilly type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, actually, having it have only one eye hole, like, yeah. seemed really stupid to me. Because <laughs> at first it's sort of like, you know, the, the stuntman, I forget who uh, played oh, Jason in that movie. Uh, not Warrington Gillette. He played the, the, the Jason without the mask. Oh, I can't remember the guy's name. But he was somebody. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a somebody. I'm sure his name was in many phone books. Yes. But, uh... This is the kind of spontaneous publicity your name in print that makes people. Things are going to start happening to me now. But it seemed like, you know, they handed him the mask, and he's like, but but there's only one eye hole. <laughs> Want me to run in the woods, you know, and with the various weapons, and how am I going to, yeah, that doesn't seem safe. But to be honest, it seems kind of creepy, because it has like a voyeuristic aspect yeah. to it, so like he's peeping through with one eyeball. I like it. Of course, the hockey mask is more iconic, and you know, it's oh, yeah. kind of symbolized pretty cool, much everything, so I'm sure they made the right point, with the, the right move with the hockey mask. But that sack, it was, it added a lot of like really creepiness to the character. Some say my sack is pretty creepy. Like before, it all comes down to Jason and one last girl. The final girl in this film, uh, Chrissy, played by Dana Kimmel, she has kind of a strange relationship with Jason. It turns out that the year before, she was attacked by Jason in the woods and just barely escaped. Now she's been haunted by him all this time, or something. Yeah, I don't it know. seems like forced. Uh, it's really weird, not that important. Suffice to say, she rises up and manages to confront her fears, you know, all that stuff. Well, you stuff. know, if she did it once... Should we really be surprised as viewers that she can do it again? That's true. You survived Jason once. Um, well, <laughs> didn't really work for Alice, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> if she were only not in the phone book, yes. he wouldn't have found her so easily. <laughs> Johnson, Navin R. Sounds like a typical bastard. But anyway, yeah, she confronts her fears, and by confront, we mean she whacks him on the head, hangs him, and then finally buries an axe into his face. So after a horrifying 24 hours, Jason is finally dead. Or is he? <gasps> no! Because after being taken into the morgue, he somehow recovers from an axe to the face, and his killing spree begins anew. This takes us right into the next movie. Friday, the 13th, the final chapter. Jason is back. He moves like a shadow, dark and silent. Sorry, you change your mind? He never utters a word. He doesn't even seem to breathe. Where the hell's the corkscrew? He simply, mindlessly, <laughs> mercilessly. <laughs> Kills. But now, Jason's reign of terror is over. 
the final chapter begins literally the very second the third movie ends. Jason wakes up in the morgue and kills a hospital orderly whose name is, I shit you not, Axel. <laughs> How 80s is that? Pretty 80s. <laughs> and then what does he do? He heads right back to Camp Crystal Lake to finish what he had started. Also heading to the lake are a bunch of kids on vacation. These kids are here to have a quiet, relaxing weekend, take their minds off the rigors of school, and... Uh, I'm fucking with you. They're gonna get high and fuck around and you know. drink until they're in a stupor. All all those things. I mean, <laughs> if only I could go to Camp Crystal Lake. If only. <laughs> One of the kids in this group is a socially awkward, lovelorn nerd played by Crispin Glover. I point out Glover specifically because he is amazing in this role. Uh, this is one year before Back to the Future, and I think this role might have been preparation for George McFly. <laughs> <laughs> he plays the nerdy, awkward introvert just perfectly, culminating in one unforgettable scene. You already know what I'm talking about, so let's just watch it. Come on, Chris Glover, dance! Dance like you've never danced before! Oh, I love it! <laughs> <laughs> now, isn't it true that uh, originally he had picked out uh, ACDC's Back, Back in Black? Back in Black, yes. They, they couldn't uh, use that music, obviously. It cost too much. But uh, I don't see how dancing to this associates with Back in Black. Yeah, it wouldn't have been I don't see how dancing like this associates to any song, because well, it's just a complete, like, spaz-out dance. Let's, let's just, <laughs> let's try it. Let's just take a look with Back in Black playing. There you go. Uh, it doesn't really work out. It's cooler. Yeah. <laughs> ACDC makes everything cooler. It's interesting because, like, nobody really knew what a weirdo Crispin Glover was before this, but, like, uh, yeah. in, in a convention once, he mentioned that uh, this is the way he was dancing at the time, like, as himself, like at dance clubs. Which now, like, back then, you were like, that's fucking retarded. There's no way anyone would act like that. But now that we know what kind of guy Crispin Glover is and, like, the weird, weird, weird movies that he's made himself. <laughs> It's not too far off. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's one thing too about this character, how, the, like the way he dances. I know Crispin from you know Forrest and I have seen his other films. We've gone yeah. and seen him speak and things, and he likes to add something to the characters that maybe the director or filmmaker didn't imply, but yet they make, <laughs> it makes them more unique. And so you can tell this dance is definitely, that's what he's going for. That was a product of his own imagination. <laughs> uh, I salute you because it's hands down my favorite scene from the whole series. Yeah. And, you know, and then he gets laid afterwards, and like, really, is it a surprise? He had the most character and personality at all these dorks. You know, he's the nerd. Dancing like that got him pussy from one of the creepy twins. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> All right. The real stars in this one are the Jarvis family. A mother, a teenage daughter, and a very young son played by 80s superstar Corey Feldman. Feldman's Tommy Jarvis character is an odd one. He likes making grotesque special effects, playing Zaxxon while wearing an alien mask, and having a seizure while watching teenagers make out. Basically, he's a kind of kid who you wouldn't be surprised if he went on a killing spree in a few years. Yeah, this kid's weird. Um, I never really had the opportunity to see shit like that when I was, like, how old is this kid supposed to be, yeah, 11? Yeah, me either. I don't know how I would have reacted, but I can't imagine reacting like that. I, I probably would have, like, <laughs> stared because I'm like, what is this? What yeah. Is this? this is different. And then yeah. I look down to, like, a raging boner and be like, what is this? This is different. <laughs> Oh, Tommy Jarvis, what is what is wrong with you? <laughs> also in this cast is some kind of professional Jason Hunter. Uh, it's a long story, but apparently Sandra, the big boob nympho from part two, well, yeah, she had an older brother who's now hiking through the woods with more weapons than Ted Nugent, looking for bloody revenge against Jason. And wow, look at this guy. He's a badass. I mean, like, he's basically just, like, stalking the woods looking for Jason. You just know they're going to have, like, some, uh, like, rip-roaring, like, awesome, kick-ass fight with Jason, right? Yeah. Well. No. No. He, he uh, stupidly falls down the stairs, and then Jason kills him with, like, a gardening trowel. What a retard. Weak. <laughs> very, very weak. <laughs> All right. Isn't the, uh, the movie sort of, like, uh playing up that he would be... Yeah, because, like, everyone knew how this was going to end because it was fucking called the final chapter. Right. But no one really knew who uh, was going to kill Jason. So it was, he was kind of like a red herring. Like, everyone saw this, like, badass guy, and it's like, oh, man, he's going to totally kill Jason, you know? It's sort of like, uh... Oh, oh, it's like uh, that movie Feast. 
Remember yeah. when the hero comes in and he's like, I'm the guy who's gonna oh, save yeah, your yeah. ass. And then the, that very executed. second he gets his head bit off. <laughs> it's like that. Any questions? Yeah. Who the hell are you? I'm the guy that's gonna save your ass. <laughs> Except I think Feast did it much better because Feast was just like intentionally hilarious. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I mean in the first three movies. Yeah. It, it was a, a a female who who beat you. You're the killer, right. You know, and I that... think in order to have a guy come in and it would sort of negate the that empowerment been... of the female character. That would have been a cop movies. out. You're right. So, so instead they went better. with a child. But I at guess. least the, yeah. At least the guy could have gone out fighting or something. Yeah, instead I mean, of just falling this. down like, like his heel broke. Or yeah. <laughs> Okay, he'll off his shoes. <laughs> Does he even get a hit in on Jason? I don't think so. I Jason just rips so him either. apart. Yeah, he's a fail. What the hell, dude? Sandra is not happy with you right now. She's <laughs> yeah, looking really. down like, You're avenging her down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. Oh. Anyways, Jason systematically takes on each of the characters until we're left with only two. Trish Jarvis and her little brother Tommy. Trish has a machete fight with Jason, but Jason overpowers her and tries to strangle her. It looks like this is the end for Trish, but just then Tommy comes to save the day. Tommy has shaved his head to make himself look like a young Jason. This confuses Jason or something. Uh, giving Tommy enough time to pick up the machete, cleave Jason's head in two. Tommy, wise to serial killer's tendency to come back to life, knows that this isn't the end. So he proceeds to go completely ape shit on Jason, hacking him up with a machete. At long last, Jason Voorhees is dead. Or is he? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's called the final chapter. I mean, what how do you, you expect? You, yeah, you can't. Not like they're gonna make up. five more of these or anything. No, I mean that's just ridiculous. Uh. That's... <laughs> So wait a second, after all this, after all these nights of horrible, horrific violence, Jason Voorhees, the terror of Camp Blood, he was killed by mouth from the Goonies. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, pure innocence of a child. Evil can't withstand the power of child innocence. <laughs> when I think of Corey Feldman, I don't think of innocence. <laughs> <laughs> well, the laughter of a child cuts me through, cuts through me with like a dentist drill. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! So that's that's all, all those Friday the Thirteenth movies. Uh, I wanted to review the three of these together because they seem kind of like a complete story. Yeah, they, like they take place movie. in like the span of what a week, if that. I mean, e each one yeah, is like just a couple a, days. Yeah. yeah, each one is a day immediately after the one that came before it. So um, I really like these movies, even though they're not. Well, part two is pretty good. The other two are they're fun. I yeah. would call them great movies. They're, they're more fun than great films. Yeah. So uh, things you like and things you didn't like about them. Uh, first of all, the killings. I mean, uh, the, the fourth one is the best just because Tom Savini came back and yeah. it's got some really creative stuff. He had to, uh, to kill the monster he created. So exactly, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they've got some good stuff. Like we mentioned the crotch split. Uh, what are some other What are some other ones? Oh, uh, they, they, they redid the Kevin Bacon death. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was weird, though. So, uh, what movie was that in? The uh, third one. Yeah. You'd think... I mean, okay, if you have a, the, the same a death reused in the eighth movie as the yeah. second movie or something, you'd think, well, maybe they're running out of ideas. <laughs> but from, you know, one to three... Yeah, they, 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 uh, they realized that they blew their load too early, so to speak, and their best death was in the first movie, and they just keep doing that one yeah, over and over again. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, uh, I, I like the use of the... Oh, sorry. I, say, I like the use of the 3D in the killings, like the guy getting his head crushed and his eye popping yeah. out. Yeah. That's Actually, as far as the 3D goes, like, cause sure, it's just shooting, you know, throwing stuff at the yeah. at the screen. The only one that seems to sort of play into a story is uh, the old stoner guy making popcorn. Oh yeah. Because I'm sure for him, <laughs> baked out of his mind, it was exactly like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and you know, being able to make a thing of popcorn stoned out of his mind was probably like an Olympian oh, achievement, yeah. so he was probably on cloud nine when that happened. Because <laughs> the sound of popcorn popping, I'm sure he, he had to fight the urge to geek out so bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, these ones. Um, they really went out of their way to make Jason evil. Because, like, each time he kills somebody that I guess you'd call innocent. Because, like, in, in part two, we got the guy in a wheelchair... Right. And you're like, That's oh, kind of he's a guy in a wheelchair. Get away? Like, poor guy. <laughs> but then he's actually like a really charming guy who's gonna like get laid by the really hot like 
friendly counselor lady, and then of course Jason can't have any of that. No. And then he like whacks on the head of the machete. I felt so bad because like the guy is like so down that he's in a wheelchair, and then he's gonna get some ass, and I'm like, yay, go for it! But then <laughs> right. he gets killed, and then just to add insult to injury, he falls backwards down a flight of stairs. It was I like a uh, Charlie Chaplin routine or something. <laughs> like it just kept getting worse. This is fucked up. But that was the one time where I was like, Jason, come on, man. Like, let the guy get some <laughs> pussy and then kill him, you know? Well, then, then there was the pregnant girl. Yeah. I, there, there, was no man, there was no need for it. Uh, what's her name? Deborah, in part three, she mentions once that she's pregnant. And, like, I guess it's supposed to be, like, you know, Jason doesn't give a fuck about anything. He'll, he'll, yeah, that's how fucked women. up he is. No one's safe. But, like, there's no evidence that she's pregnant. Like, no, it's never brought up again. Smoking hot. Yeah. <laughs> she, I think uh, she's just saying that to keep her boyfriend around. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we had suspicions about that. <laughs> but it's kind of shitty because I'm watching this movie. I'm like, whoa, check her out. She's a fuck. You see her in that bathing suit laying yeah. out in the sun? But then she's a pregnant one, so she's sort of, like, mm. off limits. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the, the whole theme of like slaughtering innocents. Oh, what's up? Then the dog. Yeah, and then in the fourth one, the dog uh, commits suicide. Or, or something. Whatever happens to him. No one is safe. Uh, That's yeah. how fucked up Jason Not is. Not even dogs. <laughs> uh, what about what about the heroines? Uh, Ginny is by far my favorite. Like the other two, Trish is okay. Uh, yeah. Chrissy was just all over the map because of her whole relationship with Jason or whatever. Yeah, that seemed really weird. Uh, but I like Ginny the best just because, like, the fact that she's a child psychology major and Jason is, like, this fucked yeah. up, emotionally damaged child, basically. Yeah, a, I think it would have been perfect. Child. And plus, I thought Amy Steele did a good job. Uh, and I really, I really wish that they had would have had more, like, sort of like the Jamie Lee Curtis of the Friday the 13th. I thought that yeah. could have worked. But sadly, it was not to be. Um... And then, fortunately, like, we're still in the realm of the original ones where uh, the, the stupid, ineffectual boyfriend gets killed off. Because, like, later on, they started, like, saving the girl and her boyfriend, which I thought was fucking lame. Yeah. I like it better when everyone gets killed off. No, they're a happy couple. Yeah, including... Oh, speak... Oh, but by the way, uh, not everyone gets killed off. Because in part two... The guy who you would think you want to see die the most. Oh yeah, the annoying Ted, jokester. The, anno dude. the annoying jokester. I mean, he deserves to die just for this stupid fucking joke. Uh, brown it sits on a piano. Your face. <laughs> Beethoven's last movement. <laughs> no, that's terrible. That is awful. But he doesn't. He, he goes. To, he goes to the bar, and I think they just leave him there because, like, you see his table, and he's got like a basically a pyramid of beer bottles. And they like ask for an after hours place, and I guess we're supposed to believe he hooks up with the waitress or whatever. But just look at the guy. I mean, that guy is like Jason fodder. Fortunately, in the later ones, they uh, they realize that everyone wants to see that fucking jokester guy get killed because <laughs> they show no mercy on Shelley, who Shelley, we gotta talk about him. This poor bastard. He has got some serious emotional problems. Like, yeah, he does he does the whole they're skinny dipping and I'm not skinny enough. It's like oh ha ha ha. But then later on, he tells uh, Vera, the, the hot uh, Latina chick that he's hooked up with, uh, he tells her this. I just want you to like me. I do like you. But not when you act like a jerk. Being a jerk is better than being a nothing. I never said you were nothing. You don't have to say it. I could tell. Dude, that's fucked up. Shelly, you just need a hug or something. <laughs> Which is like those nerdy guys. They're they're just almost like pathetic. My favorite nerdy guys are the uh, the combination of Teddy and uh, Crispin Glover. I can't remember yeah, his name, uh, yeah. but Crispin Glover. Because you, you never know like who the dorkier one is. Right. Because like the first thing, it's Crispin Glover. Because he is just a fucking like complete dork. <laughs> and like Ted is supposed to be like the um, the ladies man. The ladies man. He's got the computer and he's like, I know what ladies want. But then you, you actually <laughs> see him yeah. You see him apply his trade and he like pulls that give the teddy bear a kiss thing like three times. Yeah, he's got no game. And it never works. <laughs> and then Crispin Glover gets ass. So it's like Maybe we're like focusing on the wrong guy being the nerd. I think maybe Teddy's the nerd, which is <laughs> like, you know, everyone pairs up, obviously, except for Teddy, because he completely falls on his ass every single time. Well, he's high as a cop. Well, yeah, so then he spends the whole rest of the night just watching like vintage 1920s porn and getting <laughs> baked. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because like one of my things that I like to do is I like to envision like what these movies would be like if Jason was never in the picture and you know all these kids they show up and they meet Trish and they invite Trish to the party and that's when she confronts Jason eventually because she like goes to the party late if Jason wasn't there 
she would come in and just find Teddy by his fucking self <laughs> watching vintage porn high as a kite. <laughs> well, sounds of other couples having sex. <laughs> Well, the one thing uh, it was about, uh, it was really cool about him, um, <laughs> I forget the name of the man who played Teddy, do you remember? No. Sam Johnson. Yeah. Uh, he thought it would be a good idea to, which I, I love this idea, <laughs> even though I would never ever do it, but he thought it would be good, well, my character's supposed to be high, right? Well, what if I go to my trailer and just toke up, and then I, you know, <laughs> act high, because I'll be high. <laughs> He's a method actor. What the fuck? <laughs> That's like never a good idea. <laughs> yeah. He said like one line and then got really paranoid. Or no, he didn't, he didn't even get to that on the set. He just like locked himself in his trailer or whatever. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> well, oh, you're standing man. in this dark room and you're worried because you want to perform well, so you're nervous yeah. and you get paranoid. That, oh my god, there's a machete going to stab me in the back. What if it really stabs me in the back? <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, that plan's better on paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, not rolling paper. <laughs> Well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, thing, the thing I think that makes part three and part four tolerable is that they have kind of a sense of humor and they kind of know where they're coming from. Like, uh, part two is still like, kind of like a serious, like, this is like a really legitimately scary movie, you know? Part three yeah. and four, not so much. I mean, they're still scary, but uh, they sort of know that like when you get to this many sequels, you get kind of ridiculous. Yeah, so, um, and they're sort of like uh, copies of the second one. Yeah, so or I think... From one to two, it was different, but... Mm. Yeah, so I think the best uh, example of a sense of humor is um, when uh, Deborah gets killed and she's on the hammock and she's reading the first issue of Fangoria. Oh, yeah. And like the very first page she turns to is a page about Tom Savini, which is like it's it's like one of those like singularity moments where everything just warps together, yeah, you know, a little like inside joke yeah. kind of sort of. And then uh, part four, I think they they sort of like make allusions to other movies. Like we have uh, when Teddy gets killed, he's like staring at the um, the projector right in front. Of him. Then he gets stabbed through the uh, through the uh, projection booth, and it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of Peeping Tom. And then, of course, they have the uh, the reverse gender psycho, where the the, the good-looking guy is in the uh, shower and Jason's there. That's true. Although it's really weird, because he thinks it's his buddy who uh, is coming coming in there. And then he says this. Whoops. Dropped my bar of soap, old buddy. Let me get in here with the old pal. Oh, oh, oh. And that makes you kind of wonder. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you mentioned Psycho, because at the very beginning yeah. of the second film, your main character oh, dies yeah. at the beginning, yeah, and then it there continues you go. on, the and Janet that's Psycho. See, these movies are more than slice and dice. I mean, they are slice and dice, but at least they knew the roots. <laughs> right. And in later sequels, that was less slice and dice and more copy and paste. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bravo. I <laughs> uh, also got to mention the, uh, the sort of superfluous kills. Like... Uh, oh well, I guess the bikers they they had a point because they they siphoned the gas. They were jerks. They, had they were coming. jerks. Yeah, <laughs> Axel and Nurse Morgan, who by the way have some of the best dialogue. Uh, Nurse Morgan, oh, like, yeah. she gives off three great lines. She says, uh, first says, "I'm not going to fake any more orgasms for you." <laughs> then says, "Axel, oh. you're the Super Bowl of self abuse." And then when he asks, "Where are you going?" She's like, "I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm going crazy." That's three great lines in like the span of five minutes. <laughs> and by the way, what the fuck is that video they're watching? It, was that a real like work? Workout video from the 80s? Uh, I, nobody I, watched that to get in shape. No. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing they were exercising was their arm, I'm telling you. Just <laughs> one. Yeah. But, uh, Wait, that, those videos are sort of like those uh, penis enlargement creams. <laughs> you're supposed to put it in your hand and then, like, you know, stroke it on. Your penis is going to get big. Yeah. But it, wouldn't you just have a giant penis and an enormous hand? Makes sense. <laughs> just one strong arm. <laughs> But the, the the one death I wanted to mention, the, the one that I would consider it probably the most gratuitous in the entire series, is the uh, the hitchhiker. Yeah. She's like some hippie chick who's going to Canada, uh, they don't give her a ride, and then she sits down and eats a banana, and then Jason kills her. That's it. That, that's, her, that's her whole character. The fact that she's sort of like, uh, I don't know, uh, unappealing, and she's so snarky and aggressive while chowing down on that phallic symbol. Like, the whole scene's sort of peculiar. It just seems like a scene that should have been on the cutting room floor. I mean, it, it did nothing. It, it established nothing in the story whatsoever. It's just, no. here she is, eats a banana, she's dead. Sheer entertainment. <laughs> what a character arc. Um, anything, else to, anything else to bring up? Uh, I think that might be it. That's pretty much it. Uh, th this is it. Uh, this is like sort of the, the, the first arc of, uh, of the Jason movies. This is like 
I don't know, uh, what we call it, like, Jason version 1. Before, uh, this is when Jason was still, like, fairly human and still kind of fallible. Like, right. he, he still ran, he still got hurt, he still gets felled by a kick to the balls in part 2, which is kind of funny. They were, they were <laughs> the better of the films. I mean, yeah. there, there was a distinct... You could tell after that someone else was writing and directing them. They got they got kind of ridiculous. It kind of reminds me of the first couple Batman movies directed <laughs> yeah. by Tim Burton. Yeah, like they the had a, a theme ones. and a certain look. They were dark. They had sort of a they had sort of an overarching story, so to speak. Yeah, you know? and after that it was all like neon lights and corny, uh, campy jokes and rubber nipples or something. <laughs> so the next Jason movies are the equivalent of rubber nipples. Rubber nipples. Suit. Yeah. So <laughs> think about that when you're watching Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> On that note, this is Slaughter Film. Uh, catch you next Friday the 13th, and hopefully we won't be gone for three months this time. <laughs> Have a good one. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs>